All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Katie Monahan, and I'm the communications strategist here at the Ohio Arts Council, and I coordinate the OAC's webinar series, and I am pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Navigate the Arts Education Ecosystem with Confidence. So we will introduce today's presenter in just a minute, but first, there are, of course, just a few housekeeping items that we need to go over. So first, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode, but if you have a question at any point, go ahead and type it into the Q&A box there in your control panel. We'll monitor those questions throughout the webinar and then hold them until the dedicated Q&A session at the end. I promise we'll leave plenty of time for that. Uh, also, please do use the Q&A box for questions, not the chat. It's just way easier to track things in there and we don't want to miss anybody. Uh, next, live captioning is available for this webinar. You can access those captions by clicking on the closed captioning icon in your control panel. And if you have audio issues or trouble connecting, we recommend refreshing your browser. And if that doesn't work, try logging off and logging back in. And please do keep in mind that because we are presenting from different locations, there may be some variations in bandwidth and internet stability. So if the sound fluctuates or someone freezes up for a minute, thank you in advance for bearing with us. I promise we will keep on rolling through any of those little tech issues. And finally, we are recording today's webinar, and that recording will be available on our webinars page at oac.ohio.gov slash webinars um, and on our YouTube channel by early next week. And everyone who registered for today's webinar will also receive an email with a link to the recording and a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. So that's it for housekeeping today. Next, I'm going to pass things off to my colleagues, Jared Small and Chiquita Mullins-Lee in the Arts uh, OEC's Arts Learning Office. They're going to talk about the genesis of today's webinar, what we're doing here, and also introduce today's presenter. So Jared, Chiquita, uh, thanks so much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Katie. Just want to say that four years ago, uh, 2020, everybody was kind of on lockdown. I participated in a webinar with the Arts Education Partnership. Uh, the webinar was called The Long Conversation, and it was an opportunity to, to commemorate 25 years of AEP's dynamic work. One of the topics we considered was DEI, of course, and uh, the need to continue those conversations. Well, today we're going to do something a little different. We're going to be um, partnering again with AEP uh, to discuss something that is also very important and critical at this time. Uh, as we talk about what's going on in arts education and world around us. And to tell us even more about that will be my erstwhile colleague, Jared Small, and so I'm happy to pitch it over to him, Jared. Thank you, Chiquita. Thanks, Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I do have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you all Deja Brown. Before I do that, though, uh, just a little more about some of the backstory here. You might be interested in knowing uh, some of what the Ohio Arts Council engages at the national level with our various partners. Um, the scene is Salt Lake City, fall 2023, where I and Chiquita and many of our colleagues from other state arts agencies around the country uh, gathered to engage in uh, two days of professional development for ourselves. Uh, and at that convening also was Deja from the Arts Education Partnership, we were sitting in the breakfast line, I think it was Deja, on the last day, and we struck up a conversation, you, myself, and our executive director, Donna Collins, about all the great work that you're doing and that AEP does and uh, contributes to the field of arts education at the national level, but also how that sort of trickles down to the state and local levels as well. So we sort of hatched an idea, I think, in the breakfast line to do something like this. And um, Gosh, I, I, as Chiquita said, I, I think now is a great time just to uh, remind or just to educate the Ohio Arts Council's constituency, folks all around the state engaged in arts education, whether they're teachers, arts administrators, higher education professionals, artists, teaching artists, about the kinds of really important resources that the Ohio Arts Council knows, AEP, um, can and does make available to folks around the country, including those in Ohio. So um, this is it. We are so excited. This has been about six months in the making at this point. We're delighted to introduce to everyone here today, Deja Brown, Policy Analyst at the Arts Education Partnership. Deja, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jared. I really appreciate it. And I'm so happy to be here today. 
Um, welcome everyone and thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Um, as Jared mentioned, my name is Deja Brown and I am the policy analyst for the Arts Education Partnership. Um, the Arts Education Partnership is a proud and mighty group of six. Um, and here on the screen is uh, myself and my amazing colleagues. We have Brady Smith, who is our communication specialist. We have Crystal Johnson, our engagement strategist. Uh, Mitra Chaman Bahar, who is our project manager, Jamie Casper, our director, and Mary Delerba, our assistant director. And so the Arts Education Partnership believes that arts and education leaders do better um, work when they're connected to powerful information and resources. Um, every day we connect partners who are passionate about arts learning and the knowledge um, and the knowledge and the people that help them do those great things. Um, we do this because well-informed leaders are crucial to ensuring that learners have access to an excellent arts education. Um, and before we begin, I want to take the time to share some of our goals for today. Um, one being, we all want you to gain a better understanding of the arts education ecosystem. Um, we want you to be able to recognize the different role groups within this ecosystem. Um, and who you can get involved with to help advance arts education. Um, we also want you um, to gain insight into the 2024 arts education policies. And finally, we want you all to learn about the arts education partnership, obviously, um, and all the resources we have to offer the field. And also quickly, um, I wanted to mention that all of the um, resources that we mentioned today, the links will be dropped in the chat for you all to access. Um, so keep an eye out for those links in the chat as the presentation moves along. And so AAP is supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and the US Department of Education. Um, and we are administered by the Education Commission of the States um, or ECS for short. So a little bit about ECS, um, the Education Commission of the States was founded in the mid 1960s by a group of state policymakers um, who saw the need for an organization that could not only support education policymaking, um, but also connect state policymakers. And so ECS today provides relevant education policy information um, with expertise spanning from early childhood education to workforce development. Um, to all 50 states, DC, and US territories. ECS works closely with state commissioners who help identify key state education policy issues. Um, and ECS's commissioners are usually governors, state legislatures, uh, legislators, excuse me, and um, other policymakers as well. Um, if you need help gathering specific education policy information, uh, you can submit what we call an information request through the ECS website, and our expert policy team members will provide that information in a timely manner. And just to note, specific arts education policy questions are normally sent over to the AEP team to answer. And so who are AAP's partners and affiliates? Well, we have over 200 partners and affiliates um, who are all working to advance arts education. Um, on the screen here, we have some of our national partners like the Americans for the Arts, uh, the Wallace Foundation, and the Education Theater Association in Ohio. Um, but I also like to highlight more local partners and affiliates uh, like Ingenuity in Illinois and Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center in Michigan, uh, who operate in the same region as Ohio and who you may be familiar with. Um, all of our partners and affiliates contribute in various ways to the arts education ecosystem. And so what does it mean when we speak of this arts education ecosystem, right? Um, well, we recognize that the arts education ecosystem um, is really a collaborative system rather than an independent one, uh, meaning that this ecosystem is one made up of a variety of agencies, organizations, um, communities, and environments that work effectively with one another to provide 
to provide well-rounded arts education um, opportunities for students. Um, this arts education ecosystem recognizes uh, the, in the interconnectedness um, between a student's experiences within and outside of the school environment. And most importantly, um, this arts education ecosystem is student-centered. Um, where meaningful and relevant arts instruction and experiences are provided to students. And within this ecosystem, um, students have the autonomy over uh, the arts disciplines that they'd like to explore. And the decisions within this ecosystem are made in the best interest of the whole student. And when we speak of the whole student, we're referring to the mental, emotional, social, and physical health of that student. We're taking into consideration um, the community that that student is from and grew up in, and also the influence of family and values on that student's experiences as well. Um, and because this ecosystem is collaborative, interconnected, and student-centered, it is highly resourceful. Um, there is a network of partners within this ecosystem with different levels of influence when it comes to students, um, and they work together to strengthen arts education. And these different role groups provide different resources, and we believe that it is tremendously useful to know who these folks are. And so in 2012, Americans for the Arts released its Arts Education Field Guide, um, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, this guide was designed to give an overview of the roles of different groups within the arts education ecosystem. Um, and this graphic that's pictured on the screen um, was included in this guide and referred to as the spheres of influence. And so the spheres of influence show the relationships between students and the decision makers that surround them. Um, and I will give you a moment to look at this graphic um, and see where you land in, relations to, in relationships to students. And so with this, um, we were really interested in updating this graphic to be more inclusive of out-of-school settings um, and more representative of the role groups, the roles different groups play within the arts ed ecosystem. Um, so I'm going to share a rough in the process version and talk you through it. Here is our updated spheres of influence. Um, and real quickly, I'd just like to acknowledge AAP's director, Jamie Casper, for her amazing work on updating this graphic. Um, I definitely understand that upon initially looking at our updated graphic, it could be a bit overwhelming. Um, so let's go ahead and break it down to make it a little bit more consumable for you all. And so as with the original version, we've located learners in the center um, and defined them more clearly from ages 0 to 24 based on the work that AEP does on a daily basis. The two dark orange rings capture groups that have direct contact with young people, um, so community leaders, artists, and families. Um, however, the innermost dark orange ring represents groups subject to few policies or oversight, um, while that outermost dark orange ring is highly influenced by policy and oversight, like taxpayers, principals, educators, and support staff. The third lighter orange ring represents local level supports for arts education, um, like local businesses, officials, and superintendents. And the fourth orange yellowish ring um, captures state and regional supports like state departments of education um, or different state arts agencies. And the largest yellow ring are our federal supports um, like Congress, the U.S. Department of Education, and national philanthropy groups as well. 
And with this updated sphere of influence, um, we also try to give an idea of each group's um, role within the policy space as well. And so do these role groups make policy through laws, statutes, and regulations, as you see in that top left quadrant? Do they interpret policy through rules and guidances, um, as we see in that upper right quadrant? Or are they responsible for implementing policy um, down in that bottom right quadrant? And that bottom left quadrant represents funding entities within this ecosystem. And so it's important to note that the dotted lines you see um, illustrate permeability. Um, meaning that we recognize different role groups um, might have different roles in various states or contexts. For example, boards of higher education might be policymakers in private universities um, and policy interpreters in public universities where policy is made by legislature, legislators excuse me, um, through laws and regulations. So now looking at this updated sphere of influence, um, I want you all to take a moment to uh, identify which quadrant or quadrants um, you may fall within and consider the role you play within this arts education ecosystem. So I'm gonna give you all a moment to think about that as we move along. And finally, there are groups who influence policy, even if they are not directly responsible um, for making, interpreting, or implementing it. Um, these, these are role groups like lobbyists, voters, unions, um, researchers, and evaluators as well. Um, committees and task forces, for example, oftentimes commission research and make um, policy recommendations, but they do not make, interpret, or implement policy as those bodies. And also take, for example, the Arts Education Partnership, right? Um, being a national network that does not make or interpret or implement law, um, but rather shares policy information, research, and implementation models um, with a variety of these role groups who have different levels of influence on students um, inside the arts education ecosystem. And we also have federal, state, and local partners that we engage with on, the day, on a daily basis as well. And so we recognize that you may play many different roles within this ecosystem, which is great. Um, and playing many different roles creates conditions um, to make new connections and partnerships within this space. So thinking about um, the different components of this ecosystem and the spheres of influence, um, we hope now you have a better sense of the arts education ecosystem and the role groups that you can get involved with to help advance and strengthen arts education within your own communities. And so now that you all have an idea of where you fall within this ecosystem and in relation to policy, let's dive into 2024 arts education policy updates. So our art scan resource, um, which many of you may be familiar with, um, is a comprehensive arts education policy database that includes 13 different policy areas across all 50 states, DC, and the Department of Defense Education Activity. Um, the art scan at a glance page as shown on the screen captures all of this information in a more concise and easy to read format. And you can explore your state profile that includes the state statute code language, um, citations and summaries for each policy area um, through our website. And so some of these policy areas um, included on our resource are arts ed instructional requirements at a elementary, middle, and high school levels, um, arts education graduation requirements in each state. Um, we also capture arts education assessment requirements, 
um, and even arts related licensure requirements for arts teachers and non arts teachers, um, among other areas. And so AEP um, collaborates with the State Education Agency Directors of Arts Education, or CDAE for short, and the Education Commission of the States um, to produce this resource every year. And so before I share this year's um, education policy updates, I'm going to pull back a few layers and share how state policy um, is defined and what we look for to update our ArtScan resource every year. And so this information may be familiar to some of you, but this can be a source of confusion for a lot of folks. And we really think it's important to level set and talk through definitions um, because in many ways, policy writing and the policy process in general are really designed to be inaccessible and exclusive. So our goal here is for you to understand the language used when we talk about arts education policies. So with that, um, only policies that hold the weight of law at the state level and specifically mention the arts are included in our art scan resource. And so this includes state statute, state regulation, and state budget language. Um, and budget language in terms of art scan is in reference to state state arts, uh, excuse me, is in reference to um, state arts education grant programs um, and schools for the arts. Um, statute or regulation typically enables funding, but doesn't guarantee it is actually budgeted. And so our policy team doesn't comb through state budgets uh, line item by line item, but rather we look for the enabling language in code or law to include in this resource. And so policies in art scan um, must also specifically uh, mention one or more arts disciplines. Um, we do track general education policies that may impact the arts um, through our ECS bill tracker and other 50 state comparisons that have been released. Um, and if you are looking for something specific, you can always reach out to us to pull that information for you. And so I want to talk um, more specifically about these two parts of policy, though. Um, state statute is a law that is passed by the legislature through the bill process. And regulation is designed to interpret law typically by a state board of education um, and implemented by the education agency. And it is typically, typically done um, through a public hearing process. So whether or not... Um, a policy is included in statute or regulation, varies state by state, but often um, a policy will be outlined in statute and the designated authority will give more detailed information about what that policy really means in regulation. And so frequently, um, and through my experience, arts education policy will be included in regulation, but will not be designated in statute. And so you might also be familiar with the scenario um, where a policy is designated in statute and regulation, but not in budget, in budget language, um, which we refer to as an unfunded mandate. So now that you have a better understanding for how we define state policy, um, let's go ahead and look at what's new in 2024. Um, so Idaho repealed, um, and repealed meaning the removal of a law, um, Idaho repealed its section of regulation that established the course requirements for candidates seeking a teaching certificate in music, theater arts, and visual arts. There was a, ma uh, a major update in Missouri um, who repealed its Missouri School Improvement Program that specified fine arts instruction requirements for elementary, middle, and high school students. Um, this piece of regulation um, also included the number of minutes required for fine arts instruction at each education level. Um, so Missouri is definitely a state to keep an eye on for updated arts education policies.
And New York updated its diploma regulations to now include alternative means of earning the required credit in arts for graduation. Um, a student may now obtain their required credit in the arts by participating in a school's major performing group, um, such as band, chorus, or theater. Um, and students also have the option to earn this credit um, by participating in an approved um, advanced out of school art or music activity as well. In Oklahoma, um, the state updated its academic standards for fine arts um, and the new standards were written and revised by the Oklahoma Academic Standards for Fine Arts Executive Committee um, that was made up of arts educators and arts education supporters. Um, this update includes improvements to previous dance, drama, um, theater, music, and visual arts standards, and now adds new media art standards for pre-K through eighth grade and high school. And finally, let's get into Ohio updates. Um, there were a few updates made to the Ohio State profile um, on our ArtScan resource this year. And I am going to give you all a second to read through the code language on this next slide um, that I will be referring to as I highlight some of these updates. And so I'm gonna give you all a minute to kind of skim through this language and then we'll jump into these, um, the Ohio State updates. So, as you may all notice, um, the Ohio State statute and code language is a bit nuanced, um, where there are a variety of options to earning fine arts credits, um, as presented on the screen. Um, and we have shifted the language that requires a fine arts credit to be captured now under the arts requirement alternatives for high school graduation policy area on our ArtScan resource. Um, AAP definitely recognizes that Ohio does in fact treat fine arts as a high school graduation requirement, um, and we are grappling with the language and code that allows the option for that credit to be fulfilled in seventh or eighth grade, and also the language um, that allows the fine arts credit to be fulfilled, um, to fulfill the required uh, five elective credits as well. And since there is no explicit language in Ohio State statute or code that requires the fine arts credit be earned um, in high school grades 9 through 12, we are currently working through this change with Helen Buck Pavlik, who is the fine arts education specialist in the Ohio Office of Learning and Instructional Strategies. Um, Helen is amazing, and she is also the Ohio C-Day representative who assists AEP in our art scan review process. Um, so we are working together to find the best way to capture this information accurately on our, on our um, resource, uh, which, which may require a change to the Ohio State profile in the future. So keep an eye out for that. And secondly, we include a other category on our art in our arts ed policy areas on our art scan resource um, where we capture miscellaneous arts ed policies in each state. Um, this year we captured the language in Ohio code that creates the license plate contribution fund. Um, this fund consists of contributions for specialty license plates um, paid by motor vehicle registrants. And these funds go towards specific organizations like Playhouse Square um, and Elder High School in Ohio to support arts education. 
And you can view all of the changes to our ArtScan resource on our website. Um, and if you want to dive into AEP's history as it relates to arts education policy, um, as Chiquita mentioned earlier, you can check out our Celebrating 25 Years of AEP resource on our website. Um, and just a quick shout out to Chiquita um, Mullinsley for her contributions towards that resource. And so the arts education partnership has a lot to offer this arts education ecosystem. Um, and along with ArtScan, here are some of our most useful resources. So we have our arts, our arts ed search resource, um, which is a searchable and filterable database of research studies focused on the outcomes of arts education, um, especially useful for researchers policymakers, administrators, and even teachers. Um, users can filter their search by student outcomes, whether that's cognitive or academic outcomes. Um, you could filter by educator outcomes, by age, um, the type of research you're looking for, whether that's qualitative, quantitative, longitudinal. Um, you can also filter by art form um, and many other filters as well. And our the Arts Ed Digest is AEP's bi-monthly newsletter um, where we highlight news from AEP partner organizations and the field. Um, we include reports, research, um, and job opportunities. Um, and we really do try to share um, things for all different role groups, um, whether that's policymakers, researchers, artists, teaching artists. Um, we really try to cater to um, many different role groups within the arts ed ecosystem. And you can subscribe to uh, receive our arts ed digest through our website. If you have news to share, um, you can submit a hundred word summary to our communication strategist, Brady Smith, um, at bsmith at ecs.org for consideration. And our Arts Ed Amplified is AEP's blog where we share successful stories in the field, um, policy information, information for events, outreach, um, and different practices in research in the field as well. And our blog is relevant to arts ed leaders across sectors. Um, and our blog is filterable by category, author, and date release. So if you want to look back at some old posts, um, you have the option to do that. Um, and if you are interested in writing a blog for AEP, um, which we fully welcome, uh, you can reach out to Brady Smith as well. And I am super excited to share that our annual convening, um, where we bring all different role groups within the arts ed ecosystem together for two day programming, um, will be held in Pittsburgh this year on September 12th and 13th. Um, registration is not yet open, but um, we are currently accepting breakout session proposals. Um, and if you are interested in submitting a proposal, we have more information on our website that includes the guidelines for proposals and a session worksheet to really help you develop your session. Um, and important to know that we do prioritize first time presenters during our review process of proposals um, and the deadline to submit is April 26th. So just right around the corner. Um, and if you are thinking about submitting a proposal, um, please reach out to me or one of my team members with any questions, or even if you need a thought partner to think through a potential session. And we really hope to see you all there. And so with that, thank you all so much for joining me. Um, I hope you all leave here today with a deeper understanding for the arts education ecosystem um, and the role groups that influence it um, with a better understanding of the roles you play in this ecosystem and in relation to policy. We want you to be able to leverage your influence to connect and engage with others to help advance arts education within your own communities. Um, and please do not hesitate to reach out um, for support or to discuss arts education policies. I'm always open to connecting. 
Um, and please be sure to follow us on our social medias as well uh, to stay up to date with all we have going on throughout the year. And so now we are going to, to transition into a Q&A session. Um, and, you, and as Katie mentioned at the start of the presentation, um, you can utilize that Q&A feature to submit any questions. Um, and I am going to invite Jared and Chiquita as representatives of Ohio um, to join me for this bit of the presentation. Um, but thank you all so much. Thank you, Deja. Of course. Uh, you, nice Deja. job making some very nuanced topics crystal <laughs> clear with some great updated graphics. Lots of Excellent. good information. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. So indeed, as um, as Deja mentioned, Chiquita and I will be sort of moderating or facilitating this Q and A portion. Folks, we would love to hear uh, what's on your mind. We invite you to make use of that Q&A box in your Zoom screen. Um, of course, the accolades are swimming in, Deja, for you. If <laughs> anyone has uh, direct questions of what Deja may have said or just ponderings for us to discuss more, please do uh, feel free to make use of that Q&A box and we can get that question addressed. Absolutely. While folks uh, feverishly type away in the Q&A box, I've got a couple, actually some some reactions, and then perhaps a question or two myself. And uh, Shakita, you're so, you certainly are welcome to jump in here as well. Um, first, I, I actually, it was one of the first things that you said, Deja, which was that arts education leaders do better when they're connected to powerful resources. I think you may have used the word powerful or maybe effective resources. Yeah. And I just want to like, pick up on that and actually pull on a little bit because I think that's a really important component of the arts education ecosystem, which is yes. um, getting and staying connected to to people, to maintaining and expanding your relationships. I want to give a couple um, shout outs or even maybe recommendations for folks in the audience today um, who might be thinking about, well, who are those people? Who could I get connected to? Um, Deja did a great job expanding upon the national, state, local levels of those sorts of resources. I think it's some Ohio specific fun in here right now. So some folks I think you ought to know about, um, mm -hmm. if you don't already, includes, um, of course, Deja mentioned the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce, Helen Buck Pavlik, who is a tremendous resource uh, and a tremendous uh, colleague of ours over there at the Department of Education and Workforce. Um, she is all things fine arts at ODEW. Her contact information is on the ArtScan website. Um, she is just a, a big kudos to her and her partnership with us at the Ohio Arts Council. Certainly, folks, there are numerous uh, listservs, websites, things you can jump into, all offered to you by the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce. That can really be your one-stop shop to, to dig into anything that you may have heard here today yeah. with respect to policy or regulation. Um, invite you to, to dig into that a little more a little more the second group i wanted to give another shout out to with respect to partnerships that the ohio arts council really values and treasures is the ohio alliance for arts education and they are a statewide primarily an arts ed education advocacy organization um, headed by jared hartzler at the ohio ohio alliance for arts education if you hear the words um statute regulation state budgeting, unfunded mandates, all of those things that you heard about today and just think, I could use a little more information or time to digest that. Um, I re would really invite you to connect, to follow, to sign up for the newsletters of the Ohio Alliance for Arts Education. They have someone on staff who actually goes through all of those things, combs through those those details for you, and then summarizes it in a, in a weekly e-newsletter typically that goes out on Mondays so you know no one here is an expert in Ohio law and statute every single every single one of them and we know that arts education and education in the state is always shifting um, but the Ohio Alliance for Arts Education does a fabulous job of doing some of that heavy lifting for you and to help you get plugged into the things they think you really ought to be aware of and sometimes even recommending you take some actions so if you don't have those two folks, those two organizations on your your um, do not send to spam list, <laughs> I 
I we really recommend you do that. Um, just big kudos. It really does. This sort of ecosystem relies heavily, Deja, to your point, on those resources, on the connectivity of Absolutely. all of us. So just uh, thank you for saying that because it was such an important uh, point that I thought needed a little more expounding upon. Absolutely. Um, one more quick, I actually have a question, uh, an observation and a question, because I think that's an important one. And again, folks, feel free to jump into the chat. We're keeping an eye on it with your questions. But one thing that's burning on my mind that um, I was delighted to see, and I'm hoping we can sort of unpack a little bit more here, is that in those two graphics that you shared, Deja, the, the color wheel, the fabulous mm -hmm. wheels with all the different stakeholders, um, which I think does a great job sort of nuancing the arts ed ecosystem we live in, there was one thing I noticed at the very dead center in each of those graphics that I want to make sure folks caught. And uh, I see you're, you're sort of uh, smiling at you, because I think you know it too. Learners, learners, students are centered in those graphics always. And um, I thought that was really not so much interesting, but important to call out because we often find ourselves in our various meetings and conversations saying, gosh, is this having the effect or impact on learners that we want to? Or are we considering the learner's voice in our decisions? Yeah. So it's just something that I feel like is really worth reiterating here with this group of folks on this webinar. I know a lot of us know that, um, but when you're thinking about that ecosystem and you're seeing superintendents, boards, Congress, out of school time, it's a lot. But as long as you're staying faithful to the learner, I feel like it's all going to be okay. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, Deja or Chiquita, like, do you have any additional thoughts on that? Like ways you might see that um, manifest in this kind of work or examples, stuff like that? Any any thoughts more on sort of the learner centricity of all of this? Mm -hmm. I'll just jump in quickly and say, you you kind of read my mind because I was thinking learners and their parents, because those are the folks that we really do want to zero in on in a, in a very sort of granular way. And often it's, there's maybe a question of accessibility. How do we gain access, uh, access to students? to their parents, you know, how do we bring them in? Yes, they go to the PTA meetings, they go to the classroom, you know, many of them do, and they interact with the teachers, but how do we get them involved in more, more of these uh, administrative kind of discussion and more of the policy issues and let them know that this stuff is really important, that, you know, know that they are aware of these possibilities to get involved in it, and that, that they can really make a difference if they opt to participate. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's a, a part of it is being very intentional about including the young voices in the work that we're doing. Um, even at a part of our annual convening, we always incorporate a um, student voice component. Um, and that's usually our opening plenary session where we have where it's completely led by young folks. Um, and that's and that's one example of how to be intentional about keeping students centered um, in your work that you do and in the roles that you're in. Um, and so, yeah, it's really about intentionality when it comes down to it and making it a point to include um, youth voice and listen to them um, and really make those decisions in within this ecosystem, um, whether that's in the in school environments or outside of school environments um, to be thoughtful about the whole student um, and what is best for them um, within these opportunities that they're providing. Yeah, couldn't agree more. It, it's it's exciting to be able to get the chance to lift up those youth voices. Really important to have at the table while you're being intentional about it. That's a really, really good point. I've got Absolutely. one more question and I'm sort of dying to hear um, yeah. your answer to Deja. So, um, you know, for anyone who doesn't keep one eye on the Ohio channel here in, here in Ohio, the Ohio channel is sort of our public broadcasting system for all things kind of Ohio State House related. So okay. committee hearings, meetings, uh, press pressers, press conferences, all that fun stuff that um, only the most 
uh, deeply impassioned policy wonks are watching day in and day out. What a resource to the state. If if you're not someone who's watching that every day and yeah. you hear about things like budgets, mandates, regulations, the arts at equal system can seem overwhelming. Do you have like one, what is that first simple step that you might recommend to someone, like maybe a passive observer to this arts at equal system or someone who's working in it, yeah. but um, just might not have capacity to uh, take it all in yeah is there like a single recommendation or something you might say well start here and yep. see where that leads you anything and that could go to you too Chiquita your thoughts I know you've got experience with it anything that you might say start with that and, and see where it gets you yeah um, one place where I would start is always to figure out as simple as googling who are your representatives and where does arts ed stand? And that is why we have our art scan at a art scan resource um, in general. And another place to start is with arts education partnership. We are the hub for arts ed related policies um, information. And so even starting with AEP and a one-on-one -on -one session with me um, to get you uh, acquainted with, with that space and um and what statute, code, these things mean. Um, AEP is a great start as well to get the information, um, that initial information. Um, even, even if that's reaching out to me personally and having a one-on-one -on -one meeting, um, that's even a good place to start. But also know who is in or who, know those roles um, and who are within those roles, House representatives, House senators, um, know who those people are and where they stand with arts education. That's a great starting point. I love it. Thanks for that. Absolutely. I don't know if you saw the, yeah. uh, not necessarily, but I, I don't know if you saw that there was a question that I think might have been answered, but did you see the, the uh, question in the- uh, Yeah, I saw, it's, it's actually, it's a fun question that I'm wondering mm -hmm. if actually we can unpack a little bit together here. It's from uh, Pamela O'Laughlin. Thanks, Pam, for sending that in. Um, you know, so I'll summarize it really quick. I think I've got it right here. It, you know, how any suggestions for folks who might just might not be wired like brain wise mm -hmm. to sort of take in um, all this information and maybe act upon it. You know, we've got a lot of creatives who might not think of themselves as like the, the sort of mm -hmm. policy type or their brain might just be, you know, wired a little bit differently. Is there anything any of us here can recommend or just flesh out right now to, to help someone who might be, um, just might not be processing information the same way as someone who deals with this kind of policy day in and day out? Yeah. Um, I, I would I'm fascinated by that. I would challenge you to find one educa arts education leader to connect with within your community. Um, and meet with that person to talk about um, this arts ed ecosystem. Um, it really takes connecting with folks that are maybe uh, more versed in this type of information um, to start learning in that way. Um, and that's why I, I, I really emphasize that this is an ecosystem um, that has a, an amazing network um, full of resources for you. Um, so really, I would challenge that person to really find one person, one arts education leader um, to connect with and start your journey there. And, and I'd also say, I don't know how often people go to um, sort of state, you know, meetings, the State Board of Education and now workforce meetings, but council meetings, but really participating in, in the political process in that way. Folks are often intimidated by that and it feel is. that they won't necessarily fit in or be understood or won't use the right language. There's a certain protocol that they're maybe unfamiliar with. But I think it's a matter of just kind of taking a deep breath and taking that step and say, okay, I'm going to do this because this is for our children, this is for our community. You know, mm -hmm. I think a lot about how when the tax levies come around and people say, well, I don't have a child in the system, so I'm not going to vote for this levy. But maybe you don't have a child in the system, but maybe you live next door to one. You know, maybe you're going to, you know, pass by someone in the street whose mind and life is being influenced by the things that happen in their school. And, you know, you want to be able to influence that with your dollars, with your participation and all those things. So, you know, 
it's it's really kind of a matter of getting in where you fit in and yeah. just recognizing that there is a place for you and just not be afraid to to go out and to speak up. Yeah. And with that, like most most often um, committee hearings and um, council meetings and things like that are always open to the public for folks to come and sit in on. Um, so really taking that um, initiative to, you know, kind of put yourself out there and um, get into those spaces. Um, it really it, it really it may not may have a direct impact on um, policy change. Um, necessarily, but um, showing your face and, and expressing your support for arts education in general, um, we need that. We need that at the state level. We need that at the local level. We need that at the federal level. Um, so yeah, I, I would second that, Chiquita. I like, the, I like the notion of maybe taking a bit of policy or something that you, you can speak to grab one person, a friend, a family member, an arts ed colleague, yeah. and ask them, what do you, do you know about this? What do you think about this? Like dipping your toe into the water, into the policy space by having sort of low stakes conversations, I think is a great suggestion. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it just gets better over time and you get more um, acclimated to the sorts of terminology, Deja, that you were referring to earlier. Yeah. I like it. Good yeah. suggestion. Nice. <laughs> Hey, folks, I think we're coming up on our time here. Unless there's any last burning questions, um, we will turn things back over to our captain of the ship here, Katie Monahan, to close us out. Hey, Katie. Thanks, Jared. Thank you so much, Jared. Thanks, Deja, for taking the time to put together this wonderful presentation today. Super informative. We're all grateful for you for doing that. Thanks again to Jared and Shakita for facilitating some great conversation and questions here at the end. We'll go ahead and wrap up today. Um, just a reminder for everyone who is registered, you'll receive a link to the recording of today's webinar along with a copy of the PowerPoint and a list of all these resources that we've been dropping in the chat throughout. So be on the lookout for that, I would say early next week. And that does it for today's presentation. Thank you all so much for taking the time to tune in and we will see you next time. All right, thanks.